Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Inside the Birds TV presented by DraftKings Sportsbook. And this is going to be an awesome episode. It's going to be a nice stroll down memory lane, which we do a lot here. And there's really nobody. When you talk about Eagles, training camp, the history of the franchise, I don't know if there's anybody better to take that trip down memory lane with than our guest today. You see him there. It's Ruben Frank from NBC Sports Philadelphia. He's covered the team for as long as I've been alive. He's my former colleague back uh, at a rinky-dink place called, when it was called, uh, what, uh, CSN Philly? When it was just a little startup outlet with guys like, you know, Rube, me, Derek Gunn, Neil Hartman, Leslie Goodell, you know, a little Tim Panaccio, just a startup place. But uh, Rube is, has survived and done awesome, and he's a big friend of the show. So, Rube, thanks so much for, for coming on, and we can't wait to kind of talk some Eagles training camp with you. Yeah, I appreciate being the old guy. This is where I am in my career now. Like when, when people want <laughs> stories about buddies, like, hey, call Rube. <laughs> well, well, trust me, you're not. We've had Damo on, we've had Les on. So it's not like you're the first old guy that we chose to have on, right? You're just uh, the next one in line. So that, that and, means you're not as old. Uh, and the first employed one. <laughs> 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 yes, the first one that's employed. Good, good, good stuff. It's going to um, be weird covering the Eagles without those guys. Huh? They, we've really all been is. doing it together for, you know, forever. So, yeah, it's uh, it's unusual. Well, plus Bob Brookover has been the latest to announce that he's leaving. And he, when I joined the beat, Rube, in 2005, he was the Eagles beat writer for the Inquirer. So you're talking about, you know, when I got on the beat, Les, Damo, and Brookie were, were big parts of the, and yourself were all, you know, the prominent writers on the beat. And you have outlasted everybody. So congratulations. You've had a great career. I appreciate it. I'm sure. not, not, not stopping yet. That's right. Um, so let's let's talk. Uh, this, first of all, I want to tell everybody to download the top-rated DraftKings Sportsbook app, and you can turn a, a dollar into $100 if America wins a medal. That's a, and using the promo code ITB. All America has to do is win any medal, and you can turn a dollar into $100 in free site credits. Uh, using the promo code ITB. Rube, you just wrote about it for uh, NBCSportsPhilly.com. Is that NBC Philly or NBCSportsPhilly.com? <laughs> I still call it CSNPhilly.com, but I think it's NBCSportsPhilly.com about your favorite memories of Lehigh. And what I, or, I'm sorry, of training camp. What I liked about it is you have so many. You divided it from Westchester to Lehigh because you've had a lot of experience both. In reading them, I kind of got the feeling that you – enjoyed Westchester a little bit more because of the access, just the ability to sit down with that team. And also that team was just teeming with personalities from Buddy to Jerome and all those guys. What is, is that, is that a fair estimation that I know you loved being at Lehigh cause you live close and it was easy to get there, but that the stories and the experience of Westchester was, was maybe a little more special. Inter interesting question. I wouldn't say I preferred Westchester. Um, I mean, I, I liked them both. I, I liked any training camp, and this goes for camps that uh, from other teams that I visited, and there were a few of those, um, that that brings a team into a small town, into small town America. And it's a vanishing part of NFL history that goes back, you know, into the 30s when mm -hmm. I think the Eagles' first training camp in 33 was, and Adam, I know you were there. You could probably correct me if I'm wrong, but <laughs> it was at Lake Saranac, New York. Imagine covering training camp at Lake Saranac, New York, that would be so nice. It'd probably be like, you know, 65 degrees when it's 90 down here. Yeah. Um, so it's a part of, it's a part of football lore that we're losing. And, you know, a, a football team coming into a small town and the, and the connection between the community and the kids and the players and the team memories that, um, you know, last a lifetime. And it, it's, I mean, I understand why we're losing that, but it's, it's still sad to me. So I think I, I think I like Lehigh a little bit better for a few reasons um, I got to work with you there. That, that was probably the biggest, but, um, you know, Lehigh was always, I, I just love the setting. Mm -hmm. I love the setting. It was, it was just bucolic. You were in the Hills. You were, yeah. you know, you were up North. It was always cooler up there than it was in Philly. Uh, and it was just such a, a beautiful setting for football. Um, but yeah, all those things really apply to both Westchester and Lehigh, just the, um, gosh, the, the, the image of a, of a giant offensive tackle walking across the field with a little like, six-year-old boy holding his helmet, which is the, the helmet was bigger than the kid was. Um, just incredible vivid images that, um, you know, will 
to, to me, that's what training camp's all about is those moments. Adam, you'll appreciate this. Rube is such a dateline, but like an old newspaper guy. Mm, He's such mm. a dateline um, wonk that he is the only Eagles beat writer that knew that there are parts of the fields at Lehigh that were not considered Bethlehem uh, township, but they were actually considered lower Saucon township. And he knew which parts of the field were one and the other. How about that? Is that true? Wow. I think any prepared beat writer is going (laughs) to, well, you know, it's funny because I learned, I learned this. Um, actually I learned this when, you know, my daughter went to Westchester and she lived in, at one point she lived in these, these apartments that were right across the street from, um, what is it? Farrell stadium down there. Um, I believe they call this the stadium Farrell stadium. Mm -hmm. Um, Westchester, right? Yeah. And the stadium, and I I looked this up on an, on an Atlas, the stadium is not in Westchester. (laughs) It's in, it's in West Goshen township. So for, Yep. For nine years, I had the wrong dateline on my stories from Eagles training camp. <laughs> so when we went to Lehigh, I was determined not to not to do that again. So, yeah. But, yeah, the Westchester Stadium and then the, the apartments across the street were in Westtown Township. Mm-hmm. So you have the you have it's kind of like New Mexico, you know, Arizona, Utah, Colorado, and Nevada, yeah, how they all come together. There, right. Yeah, <laughs> but, <laughs> exactly but, like yeah, that. <laughs> it's. um. It's uh, that Lehigh experience was was really. I think I only missed two days in seventeen years that they were there. Wow. Um, it was it was just. I, w- I would love to get there early when the first players were coming out onto the field, and mm-hmm. you had the mist coming down on the hills, and and you know you could see the cars coming in. Uh, it, it was it was a it's a part of the job I really really miss. Rube, one of the things that I, I've always found interesting about you is that, and, and I want to make sure we get this one right, because it's, it's, it's really interesting. It, I remember you telling me years ago that, again, correct me if I'm wrong, your first NFL game covering was actually, actually, first NFL game you've ever been to is when you were covering it for the Eagles. Was that, was that the one covering the Eagles? You had not been in an NFL game before you? I'd never the- been to an NFL game. That's correct. The first one I ever covered was, uh, it was, it was during this, I believe it was just before, during the strike in 87. Mm. It was just oh, before, God. yeah. Phil Sheridan was covering the team. He was the beat guy, and I, I would go down and do like the the Mike Reichenbach sidebar, uh, you know. Former middle linebacker, yeah, yeah, yeah. Philly he lives in Philly now, and was coaching high school football in Philly until recently. But yeah, I would do. I was like the sidebar guy, and then when our our columnist, um, I guess, was no longer with us, uh, Phil became the columnist. It was right after the strike. And uh, I became the beat guy. So it was right after the strike in 87, I became the beat guy. But those are the first games I ever went to. I was, you know, I was more of a baseball and basketball fan. So, um, you know, I would, I would watch football, but I was, uh, I was probably unfit for the job considering my background. <laughs> and you have a, you have a track, you ran track in college. Uh, in high school. Country, was it cross country or? What, what I ran track and cross country in high school. Yeah. In high school, in high school. Okay. Yeah. So when you get on the beat, Art right? Art Monk was my teammate. Is that right? Yeah, I, White Plains I, High, yeah. Wow, awesome. So when you're covering the beat, okay, you got Buddy Ryan to cover your 1987, all of his glory, right? What was that What was that first year on the beat like for you? Yeah, well, it was it was different because you think about those personalities that were on the team. And, you know, I mean, by 87, you know, you had, um, you know, Randall and Reggie and, and uh, Andre West. I, I was just telling someone this story that one of my yeah. very first, right. one of my very first practices was at JFK Stadium, and when practice ended, you know, it actually, which is funny because that's right where I work now in the Wells Fargo Center, same place. Mm-hmm. And practice ended, and Andre Waters starts starts. I could you could see the steam coming out of his helmet. He was pissed, and I hear I hear Andre saying, "Where's Ruben Frank? Where's Ruben Frank?" And I was it was like my third day on the job, <laughs> and I'm like. This is great. Andre Waters wants to kill me, and I had written a co- and I'd written a column on the secondary that that ran like a, the day before, and I I had written that the secondary was playing like crap. Other than strong safety, Andre Waters was playing really well. He was the only guy in the secondary, and Andre pulls me aside and says, "If you're gonna if you're gonna criticize the secondary, you criticize all of us, not just three of us." He says, "I we're we're a unit. We're a team." And if we're not playing well as a secondary, I'm part of that. And 
that's not what I expected. I thought he was going to like, you know, kick my ass and uh, what a guy, but that was like day three on the beat. And I was like, uh, this is going to be a really interesting job, but yeah, I mean, you know, all of a sudden you're covering Jerome and, and, and Reggie and Clyde and Seth and Wes and Andre and mm. Randall and Keith Jackson, and Keith Byers. It was incredible. I mean, those person, not just great players, but unbelievable personalities and, you know, I thought, well, this is, I thought it was going to be that way all the time, you know, and, and obviously, you know, I've covered some great players and some great teams, but those years were, um, were incredible because we had unbelievable access. I used to watch film with Seth Joyner, oh. um, you know, down oh. in the, in the dungeons at the wow. vet. Yeah, he would like, I'd ask him about a play. He'd come, come on, let's go watch it. We go watch awesome. film together. You know, we're not even allowed in the building anymore, <laughs> you know, much less watching film with, with Seth. So um, I, I was really lucky to start out um, around those guys who, um, you know, were just so much fun to, to get to know and to watch, uh, not just on game day, but at practice in the locker room, you know, watching, watching you know, Jerome, uh, you know, crawling his hands and knees behind a radio guy. Remember Henry Clegg? Oh, yeah. Uh, Jerome used to. <laughs> with, he used to with, with the tape recorder. To, yeah, yeah, he used to sneak up behind behind Henry and then just like scream at the top of his lungs with Henry, would let, everything would go flying and everything. And he did it like 50 times, but yeah, it was, uh, it was, I was very lucky as a young guy to, uh, to cover those teams and, and, you know, not to mention Buddy, Jeff Fisher, I mean, all those guys who were around Wade Phillips uh, around those early teams. Mm. Mm. So, so when I was reading all of your memories from Lehigh and from Westchester, I noticed one, story that you you casually omitted that we'll have to talk about in a second first i want to remind everyone to not pay full retail price for things you want get on deal dash download the deal dash app or go to deal dash.com register using the promo code itb for a special offer for some bonus free bids now i i am shocked that of all your memories now i we couldn't crack the list of the time that you and i thought we were going to die in a trailer alongside the fields of Lehigh as the tornado funnel cloud just kind of made its way over the fields. That was, an, that was, um, I honestly, I, in all seriousness, I never off. really thought I was going to die in a, in a storm, but that was as close as I ever wow. came to thinking that might be it. And the fact that it was next to you, Rube, uh, of all the people in the world, <laughs> you can only imagine what was going through my mind. Like this is how it's going to end. Pretty fitting <laughs> next to Rube covering Eagles practice in, in summer camp. Oh, yeah. Man. And I mean, did you notice at the top of the store, I said my favorite memories? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no wonder I made none of your stories. Now I get it. <laughs> it was terrifying. And, and I, I mean, we're and that trailer was, it was disgusting. It was just it was all horrible. like, you know, like beer, empty beer cans and old pizza boxes. It was rat infested and rodent infested and bug infested. Right. And, and, and we couldn't get it. We couldn't just get out of there. Right. And, and it was, yeah, it was scary. We, I think we both just tweeted out the photo. I don't even know which one of us took it, but um, I mean, that cloud is like, that's serious stuff. Yeah, that was, I remember there was a little break in it and I made a run across because we used to park on the other side of Rouch, the, uh, the field house. So it was mm -hmm. like, it was like a quarter mile away and I just made a break for my car and I drove my car up to the, to the front of the trailer. Yes. And, you know, just so I could like be ready to make my exit. But yeah, imagine dying in a in a in a rat infested trailer with Les Bowen and Jeff McLean. I mean, it's not the way I want to go. Uh, no comment. No comment. <laughs> now th that's separate from the rats, right? I mean, no, I'm just kidding. Oh, <laughs> we love those guys. Oh, I love them know. very much. Uh, we I do. Said the same about myself. Um, so so <laughs> so let's talk about the the memory that a lot of people, maybe our younger listeners, may not remember or they've only heard stories about but through your eyes the the to day the first day oh. <laughs> that terrell owen shows up for his uh, the first time as an eagle at training camp uh, i mean it's been described as you know almost like a uh, field of dreams thing where the cars just line up throughout the uh, miles and miles were you expecting it that day like did you feel like it was going to happen like that yeah we knew there was going to be a big crowd we didn't know it was going to be that big it wasn't his first day but it was his right. first it was the first nice day uh, that they had two a days that they had like a full practice. So right. uh, it was a Friday. I, I thought it was a Saturday, but I went back and found, found some clippings from that day. And it was actually a Friday. Um, 
but it was a beautiful day. It was like 80 degrees and sunny. And so we kind of, and it was also, it was also a family day. So they had all these kids activities on the, on the football field next door on that field or the track um, next door to the field. You know, they had like, um, you know, like moon bounces and stuff. So that kind of stuff, we knew there was going to be a huge crowd. So I, I, there was a, there was a good shortcut. I don't know if you knew guys knew the shortcut to get in through the wet, the, the east side of the, yes, you, know, you go through Hellertown and go up and make yeah. it. So I got there like, I mean, I probably got there like seven o'clock just to make sure I got in, but um, you're right. It was like field of dreams. And, you know, we were getting reports of, of traffic jams going back for miles. Um, it was incredible. The, you know, there was just that feeling that something special was happening. And, um, you know, people were parking. We saw people parking back behind the football stadium, which was like a mile away. Um, somebody tweeted to me the other day that they had parked. They, they found a, a house like a mile away and paid the guy 20 bucks to park in his driveway and then walk <laughs> over. Um, I know the WIP midday show didn't even make it there. They had to, they had to turn around. They never, they never did their show. They couldn't even get there. Um, it was exciting. And, and, you know, and T.O. And, and Donovan, you know, they, they kind of raised their game to the to that level for the people who actually were lucky enough to be able to see practice. Um, it was really a, an incredible, uh, incredible to watch and the TO chance. And, um, you know, I think I wrote about how there was one play when it, it was just electricity in the air and there's one play down and through to TO and it was ones against the ones and, and Lito knocked the ball away. And then the T.O. chance turned into Lido chance. Lido, 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 Lido. <laughs> As like this is special, and uh, you know it was, it, it, it was an unforgettable. I mean, to, to I think they said over twenty thousand people actually made it onto the grounds and lower Saucon uh, traffic. I mean, traffic was backed up down three hundred nine into Coopersburg, uh, halfway to Quakertown. Uh, it was. Uh, it was people something around there. Else. Must have thought the world was coming to an end. They're not used to 50 people. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, 50 cars in line, <laughs> let alone 20,000. <laughs> it was it was unforgettable. It was really something. Rube, let's fast forward to the Super Bowl year because I, I think if we're all being honest here, that no, was the Super Bowl year. <laughs> well, the, the, the one that they actually won the ring. Won. Right. When they won it, let, let, let's get it. Let, let's first start with Doug Peterson. You knew, you knew Doug from his days here when, when yep. he was the quarterback in 2099, but. I had no expectation for the team to go far year two. I, I remember picking them at nine and seven and they, I thought that was reasonable. What was that? What was that season like covering that from beginning to end for you in 2017? And what were your expectations? If you can remember coming into that season? Yeah, I, I, that's a good question. I, I, I think I was with you. I thought they were nine. I thought they were pretty good. I thought they were going to be a playoff team. Um, you know, we, we saw enough from Carson in 16 that we thought he was going to, you know, take that big jump in year two, which he, which he did before he took a jump the other way. Um, but, um, there was just, you, you could, you could tell like once, once they brought Darby in and once, you know, you, you could tell that something special was happening. There was a real, um, it was a real incredible bond on that team. And as the year went on, uh, it, it almost reminded, like I covered Villanova. Uh, hoops for a few years there I got to cover the championship team um, you know it was around the same time and and it almost seemed they seemed like a college type team um, just in the unity and togetherness and the complete and total absence of egos like you bring in Legarra Blunt who's a guy who like led the league in touchdowns the year before remember that game he didn't get any touches and he's like I don't care as long as we win and you know you had all these stars who put their own ego and their own playing time and their own goals behind the team. And that's, that doesn't happen very often. Like there's, you know, there's great teams that still don't have that kind of, you know, um, unselfish approach. And that's what really made it special to me. Um, everybody on that team just wanted to win. That's all they wanted. They didn't care about playing time. They didn't care about, they weren't worried about contracts. I mean, at least not outwardly, I'm sure they were. Um, it was all about winning and they just, you know, they went on that run. And um, that's why when, when Carson got hurt, I remember writing the, writing the story on the red eye back from LAX that they're going to win the Super Bowl because, and, and, you know, it's the, that Eagles team was not just Carson Wentz as great as he was, the strength of that team was the team. Mm -hmm. And they didn't lose that when Carson got hurt. And I wrote that column saying they're still going to win the Super Bowl. 
and people thought I was nuts. <laughs> I would have thought you'd be nuts. <laughs> I was wondering if I was nuts, honestly, but I really believed it. Hey, and two things can be true at one time. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But I remember when Donovan got hurt in um in in o in o eight, and um Harbaugh. I guess that was Harbaugh's last year here, right? Um, I remember running into Harbaugh in the parking lot outside the Novacare complex. And, and he said, no, it wasn't 08. It was, it, 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 I don't know, it doesn't matter what year it was, mm -hmm. but he, he said that to me. He said, you know, Donovan, like everyone thinks we're going to, we're going to go away because Donovan got hurt. But he said, we're a team and the strength of the team is 53 guys, not one guy, nothing against Donovan, but um, it's an important lesson. When you have a team, it, it's, it's greater than any one player. And, and they proved that that year. I mean, obviously Nick played lights out and that was a big part of it, but um, I just, when I look back at that team, I, I just look back at a level of togetherness and unity and unselfishness I've never seen on any other team. Hmm. And, and it was like, it was like a college team in that way, which is really, really unusual. Rube, we know over the next few weeks as Eagles pick up training camp that um, there's going to be a couple of players at camp that people aren't talking about now that look like they're hall of famers at camp. Right. Um, and then they're either going to get cut or they're going to regress to the mean really quickly. And people are going to yeah. be like, why did the Eagles cut that player? Who was, you know, when, when you and I worked together, we had such a great chemistry. We came up with our little Chris Bermanism nicknames for some of these guys who were just starring overnight, but who are some of the, your, your memories of guys who were just all camp and that's about it. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Well, and, and I mean, uh, the ultimate was like, like guys like Henry Josie. Just going to go. There. Yes. <laughs> there we go. Henry Stole and he was good such job. a good kid, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but um, I remember when they caught him and people were ripping. Oh. He was like, he's he's going to get claimed. What are they doing? Yep. Yeah. He's not going to get claimed. I mean, <laughs> you know, nobody's going to cut a guy on their 53 for, you know, and it's nothing against Henry. He's a nice kid. But, right. um, yeah, I mean, the, the, those kind of guys, I mean, he was one um, – you know, I think, um, you know, Nate Brown, when we talk about – Nate Brown did get – did play in the NFL, caught a touchdown in the playoffs, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, didn't have – didn't have much of a career. Right. Um, but those guys – it's usually skill guys, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it's usually skill guys. It's usually receivers, um, you know. You remember Corey Greg Dickinson. Salas a couple of years ago, about five or six years ago? <laughs> Greg, Greg Salas, Salas. was 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to stay young. It might have been 20 Yeah, who's the ago. other receiver who caught the long touchdown from uh, – from basket like, Heck basket no no in the in he was the, also great yeah but you know he had a decent career i mean he he played H hank basket has one of the his he had three catches over 85 yards and his fourth longest catch of his career was like 21 yards <laughs> <laughs> andy reed really was a genius but so who, like, i don't he was like the slowest receiver ever but he had like somehow three like really long catches but um there was a receiver from uh like, I remember, like, um, Billy Hess. Oh, yeah. Oh, you talking about Billy, Billy Hess. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he was one. Uh, he was actually at camp last year. He was – he's still awesome. in the area. Uh, Billy mm -hmm. brought his – I think he brought his son a up. Any Gizmo Williams stories? Oh, just – just <laughs> when <laughs> – Gizmo, like when we were in London at Wembley for a preseason game um, in 89 against – I believe against the Bills and – um and Gizmo did a backflip after he scored a touchdown, and uh, and Randall loved Gizmo. And but you know Gizmo had played in Canada for for a good long year. He had a huge huge career. He had like thirty return touchdowns in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, and Buddy did. Uh, you don't do backflips if you're on a Buddy Ryan team. That's uh -oh. not that's not his thing. And after the game, somebody was like, "Oh, you know, Buddy, how about Gizmo Williams?" And Buddy <laughs> Buddy goes, "You know, well." He keeps doing that. He's going to be back ice fishing before too long. <laughs> but yeah, Gizmo was uh, Gizmo was a was an interesting guy, and uh, uh, I think he's in the Canadian Hall. I think he's in the CFL Hall of Fame. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Yeah, just for some reason, when you when, when you guys were reminiscing about players from several decades ago, I remember Mel Reese's Gizmo Williams, Gizmo Williams with the return. But there was some. We did you cover the team? Now, I I know this is a Buddy Ryan thing. I don't know if you were covering them. The, the, the Gus the Kicking Mule story. You remember that one? That was before my time, believe it or not. All right, yeah, that was that was a Rich Hoffman story. He, yes, 
one of those stories where you can't believe it. They took a kick, <laughs> took a guy off of a farm who could yep. kick straight. <laughs> were, were you there for the um, George Hegeman blocking oh, sled there day? I was for there. Andy Reed of, what I, do you I remember? Yeah, was that ninety nine? Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that was that was Andy's first year. Yeah, we were on the fields right by the Schuylkill out there. Um, I guess it's now uh, now a parking lot, but yeah, that was. That was interesting. I, I still don't know what I think about that. I, I'd love to hear what Big Red thinks about that now, mm -hmm. uh, because that was pretty humiliating. And and George came back. I mean, he, you know, he he ended up getting cut, but I think he played a couple more years in the league. I'd love to know what George. That'd be a fun story to do. You know, talk to Big Red and George Hegman, because that that was. I don't, I'm not sure the the PA would would really be too thrilled with that right right now <laughs> no i don't think you can do days. some of the things that it's kind of that yeah, it kind of humiliated the kid and he was a local kid he was, i think he was from camden right did he go to wilson i mm -hmm. thought he was local yeah do you, do you still get i mean training camp has changed so much obviously when it came back to novacare under chip um access was different scenery was different you no know, crowd you know, everything was different except for the fact that we could still be on the sidelines i think that's one of the special things about training camp, whether no matter where it is, when we're on the sidelines, we get to be so close. You can you can hear the thuds and the hits, and and you realize how fast and violent. And that's just the, the media is. fighting each other. Yeah, it's just us, <laughs> right? But no, it's pretty it's pretty intense. Uh, yeah. But obviously, you don't even see that much hitting as much and more. Do you still enjoy training camp? Because I know you used to love Lehigh and Westchester. Is it still the same for you now? It's, it's not, honestly. Uh, I still enjoy it, and I still like watching mainly the young guys and seeing their, their improvement and everything. But as far as the whole experience, it, it's not the same to me because, to me, what made it special was the the fans watching, the fans interacting, what the fans would – I mean, we would stand right behind the players, and we would hear everything the fans yelled at the players, and sometimes the players would yell back Yeah, uh, what, what everyone yelled at the coaches. To me, that's what made it special was that interaction between the fans – and, and the players and coaches and the team. And without that, I mean, I still, I still enjoy it. I still, you know, it's, it's, it's a great part of the job. I feel lucky to be able to do it and, and I, I enjoy it, but uh, is it the same uh, to me? It's not, it was always my, it's always my favorite time of the year. Um, and, and you're right. I mean, it's seeing, seeing goal line up close and personal is, is, you know, it's, it's something else. It's a unique yeah. experience, but uh, training camp, the, the, seeing the, the memories get made and, you know, some of those things I wrote about, I mean, you th I think about that kid as is when Herschel Walker was signing autographs for an hour at the top of the stairs at Westchester. It's the stairs are gone. Now there's a ramp, the hill's still there. Uh, Herschel never took his helmet off, but he signed autographs it's like a hundred degrees. It's not autographs for an hour. And I think about those kids and, and, they're now like, you know, in their fifties, I guess, thirties <laughs> or forties. And just, you know, they'll never forget those, those moments, but right. you know, those moments are all gone now. And, um, and, you know, that's just part of it that I, I really miss. I'm glad I got to do it as long as I did. I mean, I, gosh, I covered Westchester, I think what 87 to 95 or 88 to 95 and then Lehigh, the whole, the whole shebang. So I'm lucky I got to do it. Rube, when you, when you look at your career, right, you've covered a lot of coaches. Um, there was some, I remember, I think it was you who told me this thing. That, that Buddy Ryan was so interesting because, as we all know, he never won a playoff game, but there's this love affair with Buddy Ryan in the city for, for whatever reason. Fans, fans across the country who are Eagle fans love Buddy Ryan. You got to know Buddy. I mean, they, uh, the thing about Buddy from talking to you and Rich Hoffman, uh, Hoffman and other writers who covered Buddy, I know sometimes it could be gruff, but yet he was a Renaissance man in some ways. What, what was he like? Was he the most interesting guy you covered in terms of a head coach? Hmm, interesting question. I think Chip was probably the most interesting. Oh, really? How so? Yeah, yeah. Chip was, you know, in a mercurial way. Yeah, he, he was just. I, I, I felt like I could never really get a beat on on Chip. You know, Buddy was. You, you knew what Buddy was all about. You know what he was going to do. His his methods for motivation were pretty pretty clear. Um, <laughs> And, you know, he wasn't the nicest guy <laughs> in the world. Um, you know, he did some pretty mean things. He was funny as hell. Um, but the, I think the big misnomer about Buddy is that he was a great interview. He wasn't. Um, he might have one or two one-liners every week that today would go viral and, you know, lead the sports cast and be, you know, retweeted a million times. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but if you wanted to ask him about the O line or the, you know, <laughs> the, you know, how's Anthony Tony? Blah, 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 he would, I mean, he wouldn't answer. Mm-hmm. You know, he didn't get anything from him. Um, but he 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 was he was a lot smarter than he let on him. He had a master's degree, and, and he knew so much about the history of the game, which is true about Chip. I'm going to tell you a quick story. This is why Chip's so interesting. I was at the Penn Relays covering the pen relays for, for NBC sports stuff, uh, for Comcast, uh, CSN, whatever the hell we're See, called. you can't even die. You work there. <laughs> I, I got an excuse. <laughs> it was CSN at the time. So I'm at pen relays and Penn had three, three individual winners for the first time since the pen relay started in like the 1870s. They had, they had a, a woman win the high jump. They had uh, a kid win the mile and run a sub four minute mile. Um, Thomas Awad was his name. And I don't remember the other two, but they had three winners. So the kid wins the high jump. And I was like, I'm going to do a trend story. Penn has three winners. And I, I'm, I'm over on one side of the Franklin field. And I start like racing over to the high jump area to try to track down this high jumper. And I hear, Rue, Rue. And they're, they're starting to run this, the master's 100-yard dash, 100-meter dashes, like the old, like the 85-year-old guys running the hundreds. And Chip Kelly's on the sideline at the, like right at the 50-yard line watching the races and and he calls me over and like i needed to get this high jumper but when the head coach calls you over you got to go <laughs> and i'd never had a conversation with him beyond you know is oj atagway gonna play someday <laughs> <laughs> so so i go over and he starts we start talking about track and field this was like a week after he cut to sean also mm, oh and and um, so we're talking about the hundreds. We're talking about track at Oregon, which track is huge at Oregon. And, um, you know, I was asking about Edward Cheserek, who's like a 21-time NCAA champion and Olympian who, who ran for Oregon. And we're talking about Salazar and all this track talk. And he's, he, he's analyzing the, you know, the hundred. The, the, he knows so much about track. I couldn't believe it. Mm-hmm. And then I started asking about Franklin Field. He knows the entire history of the mm-hmm. 1960 NFL championship game. Wow. He knows like... He knew on which side of the field Ted Dean scored his touchdown. I mean, his knowledge Amazing. about everything was unbelievable. He knew so much about the NFL and, and, and football and Philadelphia and history. I mean, he's, he, he was so smart. And, he, I mean, he was so dumb in so many ways as far as the way he treated people and, uh, you know, not adjusting and not changing things up from the way he did things and stubbornness. But – um, his, his knowledge, he, I mean, he could talk about anything like an expert. And, um, so to me, that's what made him so interesting. He was like such a, um, contrast, you know, in, in his public persona and, and who he really was. Um, I, I wish I, I got to have a beer with him and really kind of get to know him, but you know, I, he, he wasn't, he wasn't all about that, but, um, you know, there, I mean, the two of them, you couldn't have two more different guys than buddy, buddy would have hated chip. You oh, know, no doubt. He would have hated Chip, but they were both both fascinating guys. Rube, thanks so much for taking some time, taking a little trip down memory lane with us from Westchester to Lehigh to, of course, Novacare, where Eagles training camp is now. We look forward to seeing you in the future. Uh, really appreciate the time. Give us the name of the two books you've written that people can still access because they're great historical chronicles of the Eagles and everybody should go out and get them. You're going way back. Um, I did a book in uh, with... Um, Sal Palantonio called the most overrated and underrated players, coaches, mm-hmm. moments, and teams in NFL history. Mm-hmm. And Joe Namath is still pissed at both of us. <laughs> <laughs> I would uh, imagine so. And then I did a book a couple of years later called the 50 greatest plays in Eagles history. Mm. Um, that uh, is still worth getting. We did over a hundred interviews for that book. Um, unfortunately, the publisher didn't think it made sense to do an updated version after 2017 oh, so Philly special number one. One. <laughs> no Philly special no BG strip sack no Zach Ertz fourth down uh catch uh, from Foles in the fourth quarter um no Patrick Robinson pick six all those plays from you know no Corey Clement oh, uh, uh, no, so all those plays did not make the cut hopefully one day we can we can do a new version but yeah uh, uh you can I think you can still find those on Amazon and barnesandnoble.com there you go there you go. I get, well, I get a royalty people. check for like 38 cents once. <laughs> <laughs> well, help this man out. Buy the books. They're fantastic <laughs> reads. Rube has been great. You know, I love you, man. I enjoyed working with you. Um, and I look forward to seeing you at Eagles camp. So does Adam. 
Really appreciate the time. Uh, please don't forget to visit our friends. If you're watching at Sky Motor Cars, go to skymotorcars.com. And if you're trading a car in, they're paying out the most money. So check them out at skymotorcars.com. Thanks again to Ruben Frank of NBC Sports. Phil, you can catch all of his work. NBCSports.com slash Philadelphia. See, I got it right. NBC Sports Philadelphia.com. No, I just looked. It says NBC Sports.com slash Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Jeez. My bad. <laughs> I, should know. I should know that. You should. Uh, for Ruben Frank and Adam Kaplan, I'm Jeff Mosher. Thanks, everybody, for watching the latest ITB TV. Catch you on Thanks the next one. Thanks for having me, guys.